This is the Good Morning Isla 200 show. This podcast was prepared by the Fall 2023 cohort of Isla 200 Islamic Civilizations at McGill University. Grab a warm drink and tune in as our presenters take you on a deep dive into Islamic hate history with reflections on how they relate to contemporary Muslim life and culture. Bonjour et bienvenue. Nous nous retrouvons pour un nouvel épisode du podcast Islamic Civilization Discussions and Debates. Nous allons aujourd'hui nous intéresser à El Andalus. Al Andalus est une région se situant dans la péninsule ibérique, dirigée et dominée principalement par des communautés musulmanes entre l'an 711 et 1492. Cela s'étend à plusieurs pays européens, l'Espagne, le Portugal et une partie du sud de la France. Nous allons nous appuyer sur le podcast Legacies of Al Andalus, produit par Ottoman History Podcast, dans lequel Jani Miller, Mohamed Balan, Chris Gratien et Farad Bichara présentent diverses informations et idées pour comprendre la liberté religieuse d'Al al Andalus en la connectant aux événements récents. Je suis Benjamin Val, votre hôte, et je suis entouré de plusieurs experts, Sacha Silla, Aditi Shekhar, Ahmad Sayedi et Alia Tran Adams. Ensemble, nous allons étudier les questions suivantes. Considering Oxen definition of Islamic hate and the Islamic hate civilization of Al Andalus, how do opinions of differences in religion in Al Andalus and Quebec compare? Let's first discuss the Andalusian identity through different observation. I think, Safia, you can tell us more about this topic. Oui, merci, Ben. Um, in the legacies of Al-Andalus podcast that we listen to, um, we learn that Al-Andalus is often treated as a sort of historical aberration because of its deferring historical tra trajectory compared to other parts of the Islamic world. Um, it's almost as if it's presented as some sort of superficial occupation by Muslim overlords, which is then liberated by um, Christians in the reconquest, um, according to that narrative. But we cannot deny that it was a significant part of Spanish history because it was, in fact, almost eight centuries of rule, which I think they said was um, only a couple decades less than the rule in Iraq. Um, we have decided to analyze various cultural products from Al-Andalus to be able to give us more insight into not only how the West views the legacy of Islamic rule in Al-Andalus, but also to be able to set up a comparison between state leaders' view of religion in Al-Andalus and Quebec. Al-Andalus, in no doubt, was an Islamic society, um, and by Marshall Hodgson's definition, the term Islamica involves Islam in the past, present and future, Um, but it's designed to connect cultures that do not pertain to Islam as a religion. Um, it is used to describe regions in which Muslims are culturally dominant, but not specifically with the religion of Islam. Um, I'd say this encompasses Al-Andalus as a civilization very well because of the fact that so many people from different cultural and religious backgrounds, such as Jews, Muslims and Christians, um, as well as the indigenous people of Iberia during that time, Um, they all coexisted in one shared space, um, which is modern-day Spain and Portugal. Or Portugal. Um, and by coining the use of the word Islamic culture was essentially trying to convey this idea that everyone, not everyone living in an Islamic society is necessarily a Muslim. Um, although, as we've learned, the use of the word civilization itself can be problematic uh, because it implies a certain... I guess, initial lack of civility or being barbaric, in quotation marks, um, and later being made civilized due to colonizers ruling that land. Um, I'd say that the word, the word civilization by Hodgson's definition still infers that land, uh, lands that are united geographically um, and also by shared language and culture. Um, I personally think that Islamica is definitely it's a more inclusive word than civilization. Um, I don't know if you guys agree. Yeah, no, that's definitely how I've been seeing it as well. It kind of encompasses all the different aspects of these given cultures, especially in regards to Al Andalus. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, and yeah, I said Al Andalus is an Islamic civilization. Um, the Al Andalusi society also, I'd say, effectively brings in the concept of Orientalism, <laughs> um, invented by Edward W. Said, um, 
then his definition of it is essentially like the way the West perceives of and there, thereby defines the Orient or the East. Um, uh, that is to say that Orientalism was constructed by scholars and historians to define Orientalism, sorry, was constructed by scholars and historians to define the Orient in order to better understand the West. But it can't be denied that it perpetuates racism and discrimination by defining the Orient as something other or inferior. And that's especially relevant in this case, especially because, as you said, this kind of this Muslim rule of Iberia is viewed as an aberration. But why is it an aberration? Why is it not just viewed in line with West with like the, the development of Western European civilization. It's simply because it's be- they were ruled by Muslims, yeah. right? And they view this othering of Muslims has caused this kind of ignorance and um, neglect of kind of the Muslim influence on Spain, right? They view Christian Spanish identity as completely independent from the Muslims who were ruling them at the time um which obviously isn't true as i'm sure you can tell me well we learned that in from the podcast some extreme spanish scholars tried to to do this to yet erase the kind of muslim history of spain um but i'd say like the whole existence of al-andalus and its history um and the legacy it's left behind with all like the cultural products we're about to look at um it confronts the idea of orientalism um, and fights the use of an Orientalist lens used by many historians and scholars um, to be able to push that narrative of like the other, the othering of the East or the Orient. Um, and I'd say, if I move on to, I can move on to the cultural products now. Um, so the po- obviously the podcast talks a lot about the multicultural nature of society, um, the society of Al-Angela specifically. Um, so I've decided to look closely um, at La Mesquita de Cordoba, which is the mosque slash um, cathedral, because it's a great architectural representation of the nature of society in Al-Andalus, um, as well as an example of the lasting influence of Islam on Spain and um, the European, I guess, Europe, the rest of Europe. Um, it was initially built as a church and then converted into a mosque. Um, it was completely rebuilt by the descendants of the Umayyads, which was the first Islamic caliphate in um, that in Iberia, so Al-Andalus. Um, and then, following a reconquest by Christian forces, the cathedral was there was a cathedral built right in the center of the mosque, and now Muslims aren't allowed to pray there. Um, but from the architecture, we can see the traces of both Islamic rule and Christian dominance in Al-Andalus. Um, and having visited it. It's very clear, like <laughs> there's a beautiful mosque um, surrounding a massive cathedral with like lots of gold and um, a massive organ. Um, I personally think the, the mosque area was more beautiful, but like that's my personal opinion. Um, Didn't Jews, Muslims and Christian used to pray in the mosque when it was a mosque, yeah. like all together yeah, under one kind of... Yeah, during the Muslim rule, I guess, yeah, they, they did. And that kind of shows the harmonious co- somewhat harmonious coexistence between the religions at the time, um, which now is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so not allowed to pray? No, no it's not. Um, and I guess if we look specifically at the architecture, um, I, found, I researched and found out that there is a rectangular prayer hall with aisles arranged perpendicular mm-hmm. to the Qibla, which is the direction um, towards which the Muslims pray. Mm-hmm. So obviously that's like the Muslim aspect of mm-hmm. it. And then the Christian era additions were just many small, small chapels throughout the building and various relatively cosmetic, cosmetic changes and obviously the cathedral itself. Oh, that's all very interesting. That reminds me a little bit of the of Mudahar architecture, which of course came after the reconquest of Spain. So in Christian Spain, these like lasting influences, I guess, that kind of fueled the building of La Mesquita in general. Um, people enjoyed Islamic art and Islamic architecture and wanted to incorporate it 
into aspects of Christian Spain. So there are a number of Christian buildings, like churches and um, and cathedrals, I believe, that are that have Islamic art or motifs. I say. Um, inscribed over doorways, over arches, on walls, which I find just very, very interesting, especially considering the history of the Mesquita as like a blend of these different yeah. kind of cultures. Well, I also think, thinking back to when, because I was living in, in Andalusia, which is kind of the last, <laughs> the area in which there was the last bits of the Muslim world. Thinking back to when I lived in Chayen, I visited some like cathedrals um, and like a big building at the top of a mountain, and it had a kind of Muslim feel to it. Although I guess the intention now was not for it to feel like that, but I guess you can say that there is a lasting effect. Like the 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 history you can still see it, um, and so I'll continue on to another cultural project um, product. It's a literary one. Um, it really drew my attention as someone who studies both Spanish and Arabic. Um, it's called Marsha poetry, which originated in Al Andalus. Um, it's a genre of poetry and song that is multilingual, which I guess further shows the hybrid nature of society um, in Al Andalus. Um, <laughs> and, and as we learned through reading <laughs> the, book, the Venture of Islam, Writing gives great importance to understanding and giving context to historic civilizations, and poems in particular paint a picture of society, uh, especially when we think about Islam. Um, and so the linguistic complexity of martial poetry reflects this fluid and diverse linguistic situation in and uh, the Andal Al Andalus's kind of population and the society. Um, it's made up of different verses um, and a refrain that is repeated with Verses, the verse is written in literary language, so in Hebrew or Arabic, and the refrain is called kharjas, which were written in vernacular, which is either an Arabic dialect or the emerging Romance language, which at the time was Mozarabic, which I guess now is like the precursor to Spanish. Um, and because of this, it's clear that martial poetry exemplifies kind of a pluralistic cultural politics that allowed for a difference in plurality and multiculturalism. Um, so onto the Kharja, which can be compared to the Qasida from pre-Islamic um, poetry. So it's a mixture of the Romance language and Arabic, as I said before, um, which, as a side note, is kind of is strongly considered as the earliest examples of Spanish literature. So they, people do study Kharjas when, when studying Spanish literature and like ancient Spanish literature. Um, I've got an example here, if you guys don't mind me. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, as kind of a nerd, a language nerd, it's quite exciting me to I can actually understand it. So it's, Muel Habib enfermo de moi amor, que no de estar, non fes a mi ve que sa de no legar, which means, my, blood, my beloved is sick for love of me, how can he not be so? Do you not see that he is not allowed near me? So I guess this like further reflects kind of the hybrid nature of society, I guess, and the fact that the languages are, are mixing and merging together to form a Mozarabic, this um, kind of vernacular emerging Romance language. That's actually really interesting to me, this connection between like the Spanish and the Arabic specifically in language. Particularly, I wanted to talk about like flamenco songs because I did a little bit of research on this and the flamenco songs themselves <coughs> uh, stem from Roma people's migration in southern Spain in the Middle Ages. So around this time when the Muslims were occupying Iberia. And the flamenco songs kind of mimic the adan, which is the call to prayer, um, the five daily prayers that are outlined in in yeah, Sana. So it's really interesting how this connection formed because you can obviously <laughs> see that if these flamenco songs really come from, and flamenco is very very important and ingrained in. Hispanic and Spanish culture in general, 
if it is coming from these Roma populations that were migrating and the Roma populations were picking up different aspects from culture, we can really see how this link, these kind of um, mirrors of each other with the Adam and the Flamenco song came to be, even if they're not explicitly related, it's easy to imagine that they might be. Not only that, but specific to Moasha poetry. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of Moasha poetry, I believe, especially in the later years of Muslim occupation of Iberia, um, was actually written in Hebrew, which I found really interesting. So I looked a little bit more into it. But the Moasha poetry, when written in Hebrew, was so similar to some Jewish like liturgical poems, which are called piyutz, that they were that Moasha poetry was sometimes used as a piyut. And I do not know anything more about piyut, so I will not elaborate. <laughs> but I found it so interesting that something that stemmed from um, Arabic and native like or local Romance languages was then used in Jewish communities who lived there. So it's really like this, like you said, this interplay of culture and religion and all of these different people coming together. But yes, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I think it's also important to add like the roles of different people in society in Al-Andalus. Because um, when it was a mostly Muslim rule, like when the Muslims were in charge, um, I said, I guess there was a sort of hierarchy, like, um, and then after the reconquest, so the hierarchy, as in like Arabic, was the most highly viewed language because um, science and literature was written in Arabic. Then after the reconquest, Jews were often kind of appointed to translate um, Latin, um, to translate Arabic work into um, Latin or Mose Arabic um, because Muslim research and scholarship and science was viewed so highly despite, despite the poor treatment after the expulsion. Um, and I just wanted to go back onto one more point which kind of reflects even more of this, the drawing from Muslim culture into like modern day Spain or into Moisha poetry specifically. Um, with that, the <laughs> from the Islamic poetry is very, it can be compared, it's very similar to the first refrain, like the Kharja in Marsha poetry, because um, they, they're both strophic um, and have a particular system of rhymes, and they're often, <coughs> in, in that part, they um, kind of talk to a beloved, or, or a beloved is mourned and appreciated, so I just wanted to draw that link. That's actually a great point, because uh, aside those those factors that have come from uh, from uh, Al-Andalus, uh, we shouldn't for, we shouldn't have seen one of the major influence of Islam in Spain and other parts of Europe was the establishment of uh, numerous schools and libraries which flourished literature and art in Spain. <coughs> one of the like one of the great uh, philosophers, uh, philosophers I would I would refer him or a master is which who as it's referred in the Islamic world as Ibn Arabi, who's mentioned actually in the art podcast that we mm-hmm. actually study and listen to. He, he happens to be one of the greatest thinkers and he, he, his contribution is phenomenal to the, not only to Islamic world but also to the Western world. Uh, there's actually 700 authentic works of him right now so far which has been authenticated, although there's more but there's only 700 which has been authenticated by, uh, by scholars so far. And is is uh, like you you mentioned poetry and uh, like different different arts. He his contribution was also mainly in the field of poetry, mystic, and Islamic thoughts. So, uh, and he was very well known in the Islamic world for 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 explaining the concept of wahdul ul wujud, which means basically unity of being. So that's like was his main philosophy. And Ibn Arabi was an individual who spent thirty years of his life uh, traveling around, uh, going from. Spain, around Europe, and then uh, towards the east, and then settling in Mecca, and he and he he was obviously and every uh, his main one of the major arguments that he was making was that 
that only God is real and its creation is just an illusion. So that was what this I whole idea of the truth of <clears throat> unity of being. Putting that aside, not going too deep on that because uh, I'm not an expert uh, so deeply. I'm, I that's my uh, maximum uh, research on it. We shouldn't also forget the critical role of Islamic society of Olympus, which played in translation of classic Greek and Roman texts into Arabic, which which helped preserve and transmit the valuable knowledge from ancient civilization to Middle East Europe. Taking this into consideration, we shouldn't forget that uh, back in the time, a lot of these classic works by the Greek mythologies, for example, uh, works by Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Pythagoras, were actually burned. Uh, and only by recording these, um, uh, these, uh, these documents to Arabic, we were later able to the Western like uh, or the Europe, uh, the Western culture was a Western uh, society were able to recover these important uh, uh, knowledge which was coming from these great philosophers. Um, so th this taking into consideration, we can uh, also look into um, other factors uh, as well that how 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 Islamic it, this whole society of Amulus was at that time because uh, Ibn Arabi was. Uh, happened to work with Jews, with Christians, and, and he, he considered Jesus as his main teacher. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he, he, he came to, uh, he going towards the path of being a mystic was influenced by his vision of uh, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, and, uh, and Prophet Moses and his dream. And he considered Jesus teaching, and he, he, he refers to, he uses the Bible as his reference and his teaching to uh, to elaborate his ideas and uh, to to show off his show off his work. So if this is phenomenal. It just shows how much how much different uh, people from different religion have contributed to this society. That is to say that from the podcast and our further research of cultural products, um, we can <laughs> we have effectively solidified our belief that Christian Spain cannot be treated as completely independent from Muslim influences as seen in Al-Andalus. Um, obviously, Al-Andalus was an Islamic civilization in which both the cultures of the ruling Muslim leaders and native Jewish and Christian Spaniards produced the cultural products, such as obviously art, architecture and literature, that are important to Spanish civilization today. Um, the religious divide was not necessarily a boundary to creation. If anything, it enabled it. <laughs> It was not necessarily celebrated, but it was also not suppressed. Wow, thanks for all of this. As I was listening to you, I think I've noticed that all of this is quite different from what we see in Montreal, uh, isn't it, Aditi? Um, yeah, I mean, when you speak of Montreal in this regard, um, something that comes up inevitably is Bill 21, of course. Um, it's basically a lot. It basically became a law in June 2019. Um, a quick overview on the bill. It's also referred to as Quebec Secularism Bill, of course. It prohibits people of Quebec who are employed in the public sector from wearing religious symbols while performing their official duties. Secularization has become more popular as a result of globalization in a wide range of nations. This tendency may have originated from tensions between East and West sociocultural groupings. Um, I think that what Bill 21 is essentially trying to accomplish um, lies in its four principles, which is basically the religious neutrality of the state, the separation of religion and state, the equality of all citizens and freedom of conscience and um, it also seeks to place fundamental importance in state secularism by amending the rights of religious freedom under the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, my research while looking for university students' opinions for um, on like Bill 21 led me to these comments where it was basically thought to present this negative image with many stating they have lost hope in the province and even intend to leave. Researchers from two institutions in Montreal conducted a survey in which they questioned prospective students, recent graduates and post-secondary students about their opinions. Um, the study admitted that there is like 
a strong possibility of selection bias because people who have stronger opinions regarding Bill 21 were more likely to have replied on the survey and that the sample size was relatively small, which is 629 respondents surveyed from October 2020 to November 2021. The relatively diverse respondents attended schools both in French and English and came from all around the province. Um, only about 28% of respondents said they said that they wore some form of religious symbol. Professor L. Byrne, an associate professor of history here at McGill, in fact, was one of the researchers behind the study and said that they were expecting a more balanced diversity of responses with more people in favor of the law. She was really struck with the results and found the generational gap really interesting. Professor Elvin's study, also led by Concordia Associate Political Science Professor Kimberly Manning, invited respondents to write in additional comments. Many said they experienced increased racism since the law was introduced. She believes that the bill, despite the fact that many don't even mean it this way, in practice can give permission to discriminate. Moving provinces can, came to be seen as the only solution, sadly, as people complained of not being able to work with a clear conscience. Um, something interesting that I came across that got me thinking further, or like put things in a different perspective for me on this, was something that Professor Heyman said. Um, he's an assistant professor of psychology here at McGill, and he just had this general take on legislation. He said that legislation has been directly connected to positive or negative outcomes for social groups. In other words, legislation can change prejudices and attitudes towards certain social groups. Should a law be perceived as targeting or negatively impacting a specific social group, many will perceive it to re reflect the prevailing norm toward this group. Because individuals create and update their perceptions of social norms based on environmental and political cues, like legislation or public discourse, the public can infer from legislation that the majority endorses attitudes consistent with the law. According to <laughs> Professor Heyman, when a law is perceived to extend the same rules to a social group afforded to the majority, it is perceived as tacit approval, thereby de decreasing prejudice against that group. However, when the public perceives the legislation to impose constraints on a social group differently from the majority, it is perceived as a group's disapproval, thereby increasing prejudice against this group. Um, but yeah, just trying to like connect back to the podcast we listened to, I think that while both Bill 21 and Andalus involve considerations of religious diversity and coexistence, they represent different approaches and contexts. Bill 21 is a contemporary legal response to the role of religion in the public sphere, focusing on state neutrality, whereas Al-Andalus rep represents a historical period of cultural exchange and collaboration among diverse religious communities. As Chris Gratian implies in the podcast we listened to as well, the Andalusi identity is significant because it transcends political and religious divisions and signifies something to both locals and those they encounter through travel or the movement of texts into and out of Iberia, highlighting the, highlighting the transcendence of these divisions in religious in regional identity. The motivations, goals, and societal contexts of the two are therefore distinct, and discussions around Bill 21 often center on issues of religious freedom, state neutrality, and the balance between individual rights and the common good. Wow, that was that was <laughs> that's, very, that's interesting. very interesting. No, I find it especially interesting in the way that Bill 21 and Quebec largely um, approach kind of religious difference. They kind of in implying that having it religion be visible in the public sphere would only encourage divide and encourage presidents and implying that they say that religion or they kind of claim or imply that religion itself incites violence but not just all religion i think we can see that this specifically yeah. targets yeah. Muslims, muslims as he's, as yeah. as quite evident yeah and in support of that there was also a study done that uh, showed that 
uh, 73% of Muslim women actually feel less safe. And it was mostly targeted, like uh, people were more extremely racist uh, towards Muslim group and especially women because they're wearing a hijab or a sex as well and Jews. And this hatred towards this normal Quebecois, uh, towards these religious minorities have increased since Bill, Bill 21, just mm -hmm. to add on your point. And like you said, it doesn't, yeah, I know that in prop, maybe the goal of the government it was in order to bring a, uh, a common ground between all these minorities, but by doing, by doing, by implementing Bill 21, they just created a bigger, uh, a bigger divide between normal people and these minorities and increased racism uh, among society. So just wanted to add on that. Yeah, it's quite actually interesting that they choose or chose to use those words because of course Quebec culture this goal of like having people's individual religions not be visible is built to try and establish like a, a Quebec culture to which everybody can contribute to but Quebec culture in itself has been historically inherently Catholic which is a point we can get to later yes. but um I just think it's really rather hypocritical of them and then we see this categorizing of religious difference as inherently like conflict inducing in recent emails from the McGill's administration. Yeah, true. Right? Um, they've been categorizing the ongoing genocide in Palestine as a Jewish versus Muslim issue um, instead of addressing it as kind of, you know, <laughs> a state committing genocide, they're addressing it as a religious divide, which it is so clearly not. So many of us, especially, like we see Jewish students on the forefront of um, the Palestinian liberation movement here. Yeah, just to add on that, I think this is the whole concept that they're trying to use Muslim versus uh, Jews or back in the history, we say Christians versus Jews in al -Andalus. But that's not the whole point. This is the whole picture. This, this is just a, like there are certain pro political entities. If you look into it as a political science student, some of us here and economics and uh, sociology students, we can look into this as the aspect, like if you look at it, most of the time these religions were used in order for political uh, political profits, right, by these politicians. And it doesn't have anything to do with the, with the religion itself. It just, what it does, it just brings divide between uh, Muslims and Christians, uh, Muslim and Christians, Muslims and Jews in the context of Palestine. What does this normal civilians have nothing to do with the conflict that's going between uh, Israel, Israel or Palestine? It's not a, it's not a, uh, Jews versus Muslim is an Israel's issue versus Palestine's mm -hmm. issue. And this genocide, you can just hide it under the image of, oh, religion is bad, and it's all religion because of religion, and because of the, the, the this whole issue is uh, emerging because of the religion. And this obviously can be contrasted um, with how the podcast we listened to described the Andalusi approach to, I guess, religious difference, as we talked about earlier, it was all about coming together to create <coughs> harmony where these differences weren't viewed as like detrimental or conflict inducing. And I wouldn't, as you said earlier, I wouldn't say that they were necessarily celebrated as there's evidence that Jews and Christians were second class citizens. Yeah, yeah these differences, they, they weren't like fundamental to like potential conflict. I'd say that McGill, the McGill administration and I guess the Quebec government, both their reactions to the situations going on come out of fear. Um, and they're, they're kind of disguising it as like a potential cause for conflict. But I think having seen the history of an Andalus, like it is possible for people of multiple religions and cultural backgrounds to be able to live together. And although, yes, as you said, like Jews and Christians may, may have been considered as second class citizens, but they were still allowed to practice their religion freely um, and wear their religious symbols, which is not the case right now in because of Bill 21 um, in Quebec in terms of in, um, 
in like the world of work. Um, and I think maybe if people studied the history of Al-Andalus, they would have a different view mm -hmm. um, and wouldn't necessarily be in agreement with Bill 21. Yeah. Yeah, and we also kind of notice the fact that uh, if we go back to the history of Quebec and their uh, their conflict with the Catholic Church and how how they preserve it, like even having like uh, not to mention there are certain like there there are certain hatred towards religion in the in the province. You could you could you can definitely notice that, <laughs> um, and we can we can see this that this whole Bill Twenty One or this whole action taken by the government is also to target Muslims and minimize their um, and minimize their impact within the society, right? Uh, so we can like this is, could be also an argument and could be could there could be research done on this more, uh, since because the, the 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 population that's mostly headed by this bill twenty one is Muslims, mm -hmm. because we shouldn't forget that we have a big major a big population of Algerians, Moroccans, Lebanese, because these these countries were like back in the time colonized by France and they're French spoken countries and they tend to be the highest population of immigrants living in Quebec province uh, because it's much easier for them. So it's kind of this Bill 21 is like literally targeting these my mi their minority groups and trying to push them to forget their uh, identity or enforcing these laws to prevent them to work even in the government sectors, uh, which is which will have will have a negative impact within the society and create a very, very a uh, big divide between the normal Quebecois and the immigrants. That being said, um, I guess it's almost as if um, this bill is somewhat counterproductive. Yeah. Like, yeah. They had one goal, which is to prevent divide, but I'd say it's doing the it's, opposite. Yeah, so. it's, it's backfiring yeah. in a way, you could say, you know. Um, yeah. And I we can notice this through the the implementation like these policies doesn't only impact the people and the normal civilians or Quebecois who or the but also like the universities like McGill Concordia or the way or the policies they're trying to make because obviously they want to uh, favor the policies that is taken by the Quebec Quebec government uh, so it shows you that how this discrimination towards a certain group. Uh, you know, especially Muslims or other religious minorities are literally shown. Oh, it's interesting how you guys have managed to relate modern political affairs from Quebec to this Islamic civilization that existed halfway across the world in such a long time ago. Um, to, wrap, to wrap things up, uh, is there anything else you guys would like to add? Uh, well, just, I just wanted to add that we think of, when we think about the definition of Islamic, it, we are referring to something that has been influenced by the Islamic culture, but it's not necessarily specifically related to Islam. And when we think about it in relation to Al-Andalus, we can then compare it to the Quebecois culture and, and create a connection to Catholicism. Yeah, and um, considering the historic use of religion to differentiate Quebec culture, from Anglophone Canadian culture, we see that Catholicism is very ingrained in Quebecois society. And although there's no kind of word similar to Islamicut um, in relation to Catholicism, um, it's clear that Quebec is a kind of Catholic mirror of an Islamicut society. Yeah, that definitely seems very accurate. Like, not everybody in Quebec is Catholic, obviously, especially after the Quiet Revolution when Quebec supposedly became secular. But the broader Quebec culture is still dominated by Catholicism. Oh, for sure. Um, however, I think we could all agree what differs between how Quebec and Al Andalus view differences in religion is how they feel it affects the broader culture. While Andalusians viewed religious differences as productive for cultural harmony, Quebec officials only view it as a hindrance to a cohesive Quebecois culture, I think. What a great conclusion. Thanks for listening to our episode of Islamic Civilization 200 Discussions and Debate. Let me thank our experts for their analysis of our subjects. And that's all for today. See you next time and goodbye. Bye. Bye.
podcast was prepared by the fall 2023 cohort of ISLA 200 Islamic Civilizations at McGill University. Thank you.